Hello. The purpose of this video is to cover the basics of system identification. The purpose of system identification is to determine the open loop transfer function that you might be provided in your textbooks. However, in real life, you're never provided open loop transfer functions uh, for a real system. So usually the control engineer has to determine the open loop transfer function himself so that he can apply the techniques that he learned in the control theory classes. Without system identification, there is no point in learning the control theory classes, what you learned in the control theory class, because there would be no problems. Anyway, to begin, we're going to start with an open loop transfer function. We're going to assume one that's very simple. The purpose of assuming one that's simple is that there's only two parameters to identify, and that will make it easy, as you can see, later on. And what I want to do is convert the time constant to a frequency by doing the substitution here. And then I want to simulate 40 seconds of motion and basically what I'm going to be doing is I got a uh, simulating a motor. There's a gain uh, with that has uh, units of velocity per control output and then there's the frequency which in this case is the corner frequency. Up here you would call it a time constant. And then I'm going to change the control output as a function of time and get a response. I'm going to assume the open loop gain is 1 and the corner frequency is or, or bandwidth is one radian per second. So I'm going to use a differential equation to calculate the uh, position and the velocity. The y0 is the position and y1 is the velocity and, and what I'm doing here is I'm integrating the velocity to get position and I'm integrating the acceleration to get velocity. Then I'm using Runga Kutta to calculate positions and velocities as a function of time. And the results look like this. Now, we could try different variable uh, values for k and alpha randomly, and, or we can try it manually by you know, playing a game like guessing a number between 1 and 100. And basically that's what we're going to do here. I have two sliders to make changing the gains easy. Um, right now I have the slider set so that the gain is set to 1.55, which we know is not right. And we have the frequency set to 1.84. But most significantly, the mean squared error is uh, 1600. Now, what I'm doing is I'm running through the simulation again. I'm assuming that the initial conditions are, you know, the position is zero, the velocity is zero. I'm executing the same differential equation. And then what I'm doing is I'm comparing the estimated response, which is what I'm trying to calculate here. And the, uh, the one means it's the first column from up above. Here, that's the positions. And I'm comparing the uh, estimated positions with the actual positions and uh, dividing by the number of rows, which gives me the mean squared error. So what I'm trying to do is minimize the mean squared error. And you can see that if I move my gain, oops, moved it too far. If I move it this way, the mean squared error goes up. And if I move it closer to 1, you can see that it's going down. And if I move it below, below 1, you can see it starts to move up again. So if I move this to where it's a minimum, which is going to be when gain is equal to 1, see that I've got one parameter identified, and then I can move the frequency. You can see as I move down, the mean squared error doesn't change as much with the frequency, and I will show you why later on. You can see that the, it changes very, very slowly, and it's minimum right there, but if we move the other way, you can see it builds up again. So it's like there's two valleys, or you know, 
uh, terrain with the mean squared error being the uh, elevation and the idea is to move down into the valley and get to the lowest point and at that point we have the, uh, the system identified. So this looks easy but if we were to have five or six variables it would be much more difficult to get them all moved at the right place at the right time. And then the other item is that we have assumed that this system is a first order system that's integrating velocities into positions. So it's an integrating single pole system. In reality, you might have to try many different models. You might have to try integrating and not integrating um, one, two, or three pole models. And if you were to go through all those combinations, you would find that uh, it's very time consuming. So what you need is an algorithm that will minimize the mean squared error for you. And the one I'm going to use is the levenberg morcourt system. And there's actually several different ways of minimizing the, uh, the, the sum of squared errors and the mean squared error. Uh, one is called the BFGS. I forget, it's uh, four names. I uh, forget what the four names are. No, the first one is Broyden, last one's Shannon, um, or Shannon. Uh, there's the uh, uh, Mills uh, Nedler, or, and then there's also uh, Conjugate um, Gradient. So there are several ways of finding the mean squared error, but I like the uh, uh, levenberg morcourt because it's relatively simple and it's very robust. So what I'm going to do with this algorithm is I'm going to, it's basically the same thing as you can see as what we had before, except for I'm only returning the estimate. And the way the MathCAD works is that the, it's comparing the estimate with the actual, and what it does then is it uses this min error to execute the uh, levenberg morcourt algorithm. And what it's trying to do is optimize the gain and the alpha by uh, reducing the mean squared error. And you can see the mean squared error is very high here. So let me start the uh, optimization. You can see it's starting out with k is equal to 3 and alpha is equal to 10. Let's see if I can uh, get it to... There we go. I can't touch the keyboard during this time or it'll stop the optimization. And you can see that it, in a few iterations it calculates the gain is equal to 1 and the alpha is equal to 1. If I didn't have this uh, debugging uh, print uh, routine, it would be almost instant. You can also see that the uh, errors here, the sum of squared errors, is very, very small. It's basically a round-off error, which means that our system identification is almost perfect. And you can see over here that it is perfect. So that is good. Now what I want to do is uh, compare my estimated with my actual and uh, it, because I got this exactly the same parameters you can see that my actual and estimated are the same line. The estimated because I plot that second covers the actual so that indicates that my uh, system identification is perfect. So. Now what I want to do is show, uh, using a 3D plot, what is really happening. Right now it's plotting the, uh, it's doing the calculations because it's got to run through this, these iterations. It's doing it uh, 21 by 21 times or 400 and 400 some odd times. And what is, as I'm changing these indexes, I'm going in steps of one tenth. It'll stop here in a second. Ah, here we go. So this is what the plot looks like. And there's the gain is on this axis. And you can see, as we found out before, the uh, slopes are very, very steep. Changing the gain just a little bit causes the uh, uh, mean squared error to change quite a bit, whereas the frequency if I move this around this way, you can see the, the alpha, that's the frequency. Going this way, 
uh, changes very, very little. And it's much more difficult to determine the frequency than it is the, uh, the gain. If we were to go down below, I have the information plotted out. You gotta remember I've multiplied all these numbers by uh, 0.1. So this is the perfect solution where the gain here and the frequency here are zero or the sum of mean squared error for, uh, um, for the, the correct frequency and gain is zero. And you can see that moving this way or this way along the gain axis, the numbers, the mean squared error changes quite a bit, whereas if I change the frequency this way, the mean squared error doesn't change much at all. So hopefully this gives a gives you a better idea of what is happening with system identification. And just remember that it gets much more complicated when you have five or six parameters because then you're working in many different dimensions and it's much more difficult to try to picture what is actually happening and it's the number of iterations that you're going to see over here are going to be much greater. That concludes the video.